It's now my pleasure to introduce Michael Garrett. Michael Garrett, MD, our 2020 honoree, is a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst who has spent his career working in public psychiatric hospitals and clinics in New York City. He is Professor Emeritus of Clinical Psychiatry at SUNY Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York, and a faculty member of the Psychoanalytic Association of New York. He has written about and is an advocate for the essential role of psychotherapy as an aid to persons recovering from extreme states. Today, he will be talking about the relationship between psychosis and ordinary mental life. Dr. Garrett. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and uh, so I consider this the bravest act of my day. I'm going to take the headphones off because I don't think I will need them for a while, and I'll put them back on later. So, um, anyway, uh, I want to thank the committee for um, selecting me for this honor this year. Uh, complete surprise, lovely surprise. It's one of the uh, nicest things uh, probably that's ever happened to me. Uh, we are speaking a lot necessarily about, about being seen, by being seen by others, by our essence being seen. Uh, and uh, this uh, helps me to, to feel seen uh, about some work that's been very important to me over the course of my life. And ISPS, uh, which I've been a lifetime member for a while, uh, I think is, it's, it's my people, it's my community. Um, and uh, <laughs> my other goal was to get through this hour without choking up, but I just failed uh, in that regard. So, uh, so let me push on. Um, I uh, wanted to make some brief links to the um, talks by uh, Chaku and Francoise. Uh, and uh, I'll uh, do that as I go along in the talk today. Um, one of the uh, essential points I think that uh, Chaku made is the importance and the power of uh, seeing the humanity of other people, uh, despite uh, some of the um, sometimes confusing veneers that surround people. And uh, I was reminded as I was thinking about that, about two photographs uh, that uh, I think in my opinion, I did a lot to end the war in Vietnam. Two photographs. Uh, I think you know the ones I mean. There's one of a terrified little girl running down a road. <clears throat> and there's another of a um, general executing a Viet Cong soldier. Uh, those two photographs uh, brought the, uh, the horror and the essential humanity of uh, the situation in Vietnam home to anyone who would see that picture. And uh, that's part of our challenge, I think, uh, trying to bring the essential humanity of uh, extreme states uh, to uh, be apparent you know, to uh, anyone who's prepared to listen. I also uh, will be talking a good deal about the power of storytelling, uh, which is uh, essentially the way I, I listen to people. I try to listen to their stories and have an idea about what it's about. I also found it funny this morning, uh, psychoanalysts pay attention to their associations. Uh, and I was uh, thinking this morning about uh, uh, the album by Pink Floyd called The Wall. And uh, I may be dating myself by saying that uh, I know about that album, but maybe some of you have heard of it. Well, there's a line in there that says, uh, hello, <clears throat> uh, is anybody out there? Uh, can, can you hear me? And uh, I think uh, that is, uh, sums up our task. Uh, uh, there's somebody in there uh, and we're trying to hear them. Uh, all right, uh, again, I'm, this is a charge to myself. I hope I'm done with the uh, choking up. So on with the story. So since it's about storytelling, uh, I thought I would tell you a little story about myself. Uh, I, uh, my father is a military officer, uh, and my mother was uh, a nurse in World War II. Uh, I was never uh, abused as a child, uh, never neglected. Uh, I have to say that I had a period of uh, intense anxiety in college when I had to make a, a fundamental decision about the direction of my life. Um, it didn't result in a psychotic episode, but uh, I felt very close to uh, an abyss, and it's something I've never forgotten and something that in retrospect, I'm very glad uh, that happened to me. 
Uh, I'm the oldest of three uh, siblings, and uh, part of my story is that uh, when we moved to the outskirts of Washington, D.C., uh, my father bought a house uh, with um, three bedrooms, not four, a bedroom for my parents, one for my brother, one for my sister, but none for me. Uh, and uh, he made a room in the basement of the house. And uh, I don't want to sound like some pathetic uh, character from a Charles Dickens novel, uh, but it was cold down there. Uh, I had a space heater. Uh, the It uh, uh, wasn't insulated. Uh, and I came to think about myself uh, there as uh, the boy who lives in the basement. And uh, that, uh, I think, uh, became the formation of a certain identity as a listener, as an outsider, <coughs> uh, as somebody who is uh, uh, on the edge of things. And this stood me in good stead in medical school uh, because uh, I came to see the uh, patients on the psychiatric rotation as, uh, as outsiders, uh, as people who uh, were once uh, uh, much more easily recognizable as just uh, mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, uh, who now uh, were uh, presenting in this uh, difficult to understand form. So uh, uh, I uh, took a stand with, with the outsiders. The sorrows, these, these little sorrows of my life are nothing compared to the uh, traumas that uh, predispose people to psychotic experience. Um, one of the reasons, I think, for the uh, categorization, the diagnostic categorization of extreme states is the difficulty that uh, the general public has in understanding in a simple and empathic way uh, what psychotic experience is about. And uh, in my work as a doctor and a teacher, this is something I try to get across to the, uh, uh, the medical students and uh, young psychiatrists. Uh, and as Harry Sack Sullivan said in that famous quote, uh, we're all more simply human than otherwise. So that's what this talk is about. I want to make two connections between uh, psychosis and uh, ordinary mental life, something that's common to us all. First, I'm going to talk about persecutory delusions, states of paranoia, uh, and the common everyday, not hopefully not every day, but uh, the common reaction of overreacting to something that's happened in one's life. So that's the first link. The second link is I want to talk about the similarity between um, delusional narratives, fairy tales, uh, and uh, the ordinary fantasy life of uh, children. And finally, I want to talk about uh, the personal myths that we all compose to explain who we are and make account uh, of our lives. And throughout the talk, I'll be developing the metaphor that, uh, actually, it's not a metaphor. I think it's literally true, uh, that the narrative content of psychosis, it's an autobiographical play. Uh, it's not staged up on the theater. Uh, it's staged in the real world uh, where... Uh, the neighbor's apartment is just off stage uh, and uh, uh, one's block in the neighborhood uh, is part of the set. All right. First, persecutory delusions. Um, I'm gonna tell you a story now, Samantha's story. And the essence of the story is that uh, Samantha believed that her cat was plotting uh, to murder her. So here's the background. <clears throat> um, a colleague of mine at my analytic institute uh, referred her to me uh, when she um, was becoming increasingly depressed. She'd expressed some suicidal um, ideation uh, and uh, changes in medication had uh, done nothing to ameliorate this uh, state. Uh, Samantha had been sexually and physically abused as a child. Uh, she was in her early 40s. She was working as a home health aide, and she'd had a stable uh, uh, relationship uh, living with another woman for the past 15 years, and that relationship was uh, the um, center of her um, extended family. So uh, I uh, uh, met with uh, Samantha for a consultation, and uh, I went into the consultation thinking that uh, it, it, it wasn't literally true that the cat was plotting and calculating, you know, how to murder her. Uh, but I also assumed that there was some figurative truth to uh, this idea uh, and that it wasn't something to be brushed aside, but rather something that was very important to try to understand. And 
right at the uh, beginning of our consultation, I wondered, given her idea that the cat wanted to murder her, why didn't she just get rid of the cat? Uh, that would seem to be the most logical thing to do. Uh, but as I uh, talked to her, I came to some understanding of, uh, I think, you know, why that didn't happen, why that wasn't the case. So uh, I'll go back and forth between uh, talking and uh, uh, reading a little bit. So the cat idea is a precious window into Samantha's inner world without her being consciously aware of her having done so. Informing her delusional narrative, Samantha's mind has already done a great deal of work in the service of her psychological survival. She has gathered together disparate threads of memory and experience and condensed them into a symbol, the cat, that is densely expressive of psychological meaning. Samantha, the cat, and as we so soon see, her partner, are the three main characters in her autobiographical play. I wanted to understand what events led her to conclude uh, that her cat planned to murder her. I wanted to understand the meaning of her story. Without irony and earnestly, I asked Samantha if she knew when and how her cat planned to murder her. I wanted to underscore this, that when talking to someone about uh, uh, a, a delusional uh, belief that they have, uh, one uh, must uh, banish any sense of uh, smugness or uh, uh, irony about the situation, uh, but listen as though you're listening to a person trying to tell you something that's extremely important for you to uh, understand. So she said, yes, uh, she knew uh, how her plan, her cat planned to murder her. Uh, she told me, they bite the jugular. She plans to do it at night when I'm sleeping. And when I repeated, bite the jugular, uh, to get her to say a bit more about this, she responded as though I must have been a bit naive and sheltered uh, that I hadn't seen, you know, many uh, African safari movies. And she says, uh, yeah, they bite the jugular, uh, you know, like on those uh, safari shows on TV. Uh, so, um, in our second meeting, um, I asked her, uh, had she had any reflections on uh, our first conversation? And she said she had. Uh, and she said uh, that uh, she started the session, uh, which really put me at ease. And I thought, okay, all right, we're, uh, we're off to a good start. She said, I still think my cat plans to murder me, but I no longer think she has the means to do it. So, um, what is essentially, if one wants to put a name to the technique, some CBT work in the first session, uh, we now had some space to uh, talk and uh, understand a bit more so that the terror of her imminent death uh, wasn't uh, crowding out uh, you know, any other kind of discourse. So I asked her some more about how this had come about. Had she always felt this way about the cat? And she'd had the cat uh, for many years and uh, no, this realization had come to her in uh, the last uh, six weeks or so. And uh, it was uh, clear from uh, the story that this change in her feeling about the cat uh, had come at a time when her partner uh, had uh, started a new job. And uh, in the past, uh, Samantha had uh, been in the habit of calling her partner at work uh, a couple times a day just to check in, you know, to uh, reaffirm the emotional connection. Uh, and this has been a part of her feeling uh, secure and safe over the years, because when she was a kid, uh, having been abused, uh, she, she didn't have the benefit of a secure attachment to her caregivers. So what had happened in the new job is that um, her partner was now working in an open office space, and the boss would circulate around the office to make sure people were doing their work. Uh, and uh, so when Samantha would call, uh, she felt that her partner was rushing her off the phone. Uh, and she had the impression that her partner didn't want to talk to her anymore. Uh, and slowly, she developed a deepening conviction uh, that her partner uh, had fallen out of love with her. That's why she was suicidal, uh, because the most important thing in her life uh, was now uh, in danger as far as she was concerned. It, it wasn't some um, uh, aberration, sudden biological aberration of uh, her serotonin system. Uh, it was something that was going on in her life and in her fantasy life. So uh, as she continued to tell her story, uh, as she was wondering what's happened, 
why doesn't my partner love me anymore? Uh, because this came as quite a surprise to her. And her partner denied it, by the way. Her partner said, no, you know, my feelings for you haven't changed. Uh, she started thinking, and that's when the cat idea came to her. And she reasoned as follows. Uh, the cat was in the habit of jumping up on bed and on the bed at night between the two of them and nestling down uh, between them. Uh, and she had the idea then uh, that the cat was uh, physically coming between the two of them, but this took on a new meaning, that the cat was emotionally coming between her and her partner. And uh, she'd seen the cat do this hundreds of times before. This was nothing new. But in the state of terror that she felt, uh, a whole new meaning was attached to uh, this mundane event of the cat hopping, hopping up on the bed and snuggling in, uh, which was actually a demonstration of uh, mutual affection you know, for uh, both of them. So it was literally false uh, that the cat was plotting to murder her, uh, but Samantha's story was symbolically true. Losing her partner, the most precious person in her life, would have been the death of her. That's why she felt suicidal. Given how Samantha had been emotionally scarred <clears throat> by the physical and sexual abuse of her childhood, she didn't trust easily. She wasn't about to grieve her partner's loss and find anybody else to live with. It was her partner or no one. Her partner's reluctance to speak to her on the phone felt to her like a betrayal, very much like the abandonment that she had felt uh, when she was a kid. Uh, and when she tried to give love when she was a kid and to receive love, uh, but got abuse instead. So what was going on here is that there was uh, a fragile balance in uh, Samantha's emotional life, uh, which was uh, well sustained by her work and the steadiness of her relationship with her partner. Uh, but just this event, this seeming reluctance of her partner uh, to uh, speak with her, triggered a cascade, a descent uh, into her, uh, the experience of the painful past. Uh, and uh, her life in the present uh, came to feel quite like she had felt uh, when she was a kid. So uh, we now come to the question of uh, why didn't Samantha just get rid of the cat? Um, and uh, the reason for that uh, was uh, that um, the, uh, uh, the, the cat was a container of hope for her. Uh, the, she, she really had two uh, ways to think about the situation, two versions of the story. One is that her partner uh, had actually fallen out of love for her for intrinsic reasons, internal reasons, complicated reasons that likely had no simple solution uh, and uh, that uh, might even be difficult to speak about. And maybe the partner didn't even know why. So that was one version of the story. The other version of the story was the persecutor, that the cat was uh, responsible for the whole thing, that the cat was the interloper, the cat was the one who was alienating her affections. So that's why she needed the uh, cat. The cat was the container of her hope, uh, and it was actually uh, something that kept her going so that there was this delicate suspended animation between uh, her terror of the cat uh, and uh, her need to keep the cat in the picture. Another thing to think about the story is that uh, if we stand back from the story, you know, we can say that someone in the story uh, is contemplating murder. And in the story, it's the cat. In the story, it's not Samantha. But in uh, real life, um, it, it's Samantha, because Samantha is the one that wrote this play. She's the one that cast the characters. Uh, it's parts of her mind that are projected into uh, and bring to life the characters in the story. And what's going on here is that um, the um, anger that uh, an abused child feels, but uh, feels they can't express uh, for just inviting uh, more uh, attack by the uh, uh, abusing caregiver, uh, that has to be suppressed. Uh, and uh, what happened in this situation is that um, uh, Samantha couldn't feel angry at her partner. She focused all of her emotions on the cat because uh, thinking that her partner had really fallen out of love with her was too complicated uh, an experience for her. So in Samantha's autobiographical play, there's a cast of three characters. 
the self, the cat, and the partner. Uh, and the script depicts someone in the play who's plotting to murder someone. In the play, it's the cat, but in real life, it's Samantha who's feeling murderous, like the abused child who cannot allow herself to be angry at the caretakers who were abusing her. Samantha cannot allow herself to feel the rage she would naturally feel were her partner to abandon her and then say to her face, no, my feelings for you haven't changed. Because Samantha felt that it was obvious that her feelings had changed and she would have perceived her partner as just lying. The three separate characters in Samantha's story are all shaped by projected aspects of Samantha's mind. This is true of all storytelling. I've used Samantha's story to show how ordinary um, human, how, how ordinary the human content of her delusional narrative is, how much sense it makes if one just takes the time to have an ambition to understand it. It's painful and tragic, but in its essence, it's very simple. It's about the need <clears throat> to give love and to feel uh, that we uh, can share love and that we are loved uh, by other people. That's what it was about. Right. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna shift here from uh, psychosis to ordinary mental life. I assume that uh, uh, most of you have had the experience of uh, every once in a while, uh, what we say, overreacting to something that happened, uh, where you have a sudden sense of panic, uh, but then you uh, try to uh, counsel yourself and you say, oh, you know, uh, seems like a catastrophe is about to happen, but uh, it really isn't. I don't think it's that bad. Uh, and you try to talk yourself down from this overreaction. And in my experience, I mean, I have overreactions like that from time to time, and I'll tell you about one in a minute. Uh, and uh, usually they're, uh, they're uh, intense, you know, for a brief period of time, seconds, minutes, uh, then they can linger on, you know, for an hour or more. And sometimes they linger on into the next day uh, where there's a kind of struggle in your mind where on the one hand, the, the emotional part of you is saying, oh, you know, I think something terrible is going on, something terrible has happened. Uh, but the other part of your mind is trying to reassure you um, no, it's not as bad as you think. You're exaggerating. You're overreacting. So here's another part of my story. Uh, before I started my psychoanalysis and uh, understood the sources of this, uh, I used to overreact to getting letters from the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, and my uh, tax returns were squeaky clean. In fact, my accountant said, what's the matter with you? You know, you're a professional. Put in some more deductions. You know, you can, uh, you, you know, do you ever watch TV? You can deduct some of that, you know. So uh, my tax returns were squeaky clean, but I would get anxious, you know, whenever I got a letter from the IRS because I thought, oh, it was an announcement of, a, of an audit. And uh, rationally, uh, you know, uh, what usually uh, the letter was, was it was just a, a routine generic notice that, five, that Form 501A has been replaced by Form 501B, you know, as an American taxpayer, be so apprised. But it didn't feel that way to me. It felt like a threat. It felt like something was uh, about to happen and that they were going to audit me. And then I would say to my rational side would say, well, so what if they audit you? You know, uh, you're not cheating on your tax return. And even if you owe them some extra money, uh, what's the big deal? But it, it went deeper than that. Uh, I had a deeper fear, uh, a fear that somehow the IRS uh, was going to ruin me. Uh, and I actually couldn't clearly imagine <laughs> how that was going to happen. I, I, I couldn't put form to the terror, uh, but I realized that my fear that the IRS was coming for me uh, was actually a derivative of fear that my father was coming for me. My father was a military man. Uh, he kept a pistol by the side of his bed uh, when he was growing up. Uh, he was um, uh, kind to me at times, but he also had a uh, temper. Uh, and uh, my, uh, I grew up as a little boy, very frightened of him. Uh, and uh, this idea of, uh, you know, the, the, the scary uh, persecutor coming for me uh, found its way to come to life uh, in my fears of the IRS. But I can assure you that I'm all better now. Uh, I uh, open letters from the IRS uh, without the slightest concern. 
The general point to be made here is that uh, while my reaction to the IRS was uh, not logical and not reasonable, and in that sense, uh, I, I had an inappropriate affect, uh, considered in another way, considered from the point of view of what psychoanalysts call psychic reality, my reaction was in perfect proportion uh, to the threat that I felt internally. So for me too, uh, it wasn't literally true that my life was on the edge of ruin every time I got a letter from the IRS, but it was figuratively true. It was emotionally true uh, that I was in that moment uh, drawn to face uh, my fear of my father. So Samantha was doing the same kind of thing uh, in her story. Uh, in my psychoanalysis, I was able, with the help of my analyst, to face my fears of my father. I could put it into words. I could re-experience it emotionally. And my task, though difficult, uh, was uh, uh, pretty easy compared to uh, the similar task for Samantha, because she had uh, things that were so much more terrible uh, to remember. So she didn't remember them literally. She remembered them in the form of a story. <clears throat> okay, I'm now moving to uh, part two of the talk. Um, I'm gonna talk about the relationship between uh, delusional narratives uh, and the um, ordinary life of uh, small children uh, and uh, fairy tales. So here's another story. This is Dorothy's story. Uh, Dorothy uh, lived with her parents uh, in a town that was adjacent to uh, a mountain park. Uh, and she'd overheard her parents talking about how um, uh, a coyote had been seen in town, had come down from the mountains, uh, and that a neighbor's cat was missing. So. Uh, Dorothy uh, put two and two together, uh, and she uh, concluded what the parents were thinking, uh, that the coyote had uh, uh, taken the cat. So uh, Dorothy is uh, thinking about all of this, anxious about it, uh, and uh, she goes for a walk with her grandparents. So we're walking across uh, an open park, um, uh, similar to the area you know, where the cat might have been out in the open and taken by the coyote. So we're walking through the park uh, and suddenly uh, Dorothy jumps up on a park bench and uh, shouts in an excited voice, uh, they're attacking, they're attacking, the coyotes are biting you, the coyotes are biting you. So uh, we were suddenly made aware that we were under attack uh, by coyotes. And uh, we quickly understood uh, you know, the, the theme, or the, the need for this play to be staged. Uh, so uh, we started uh, shaking our legs, you know, uh, as though to shake off the attackers and then pleaded with Dorothy, Dorothy, can we jump up there with you? Uh, can we jump up, you know, on the bench? Uh, so uh, like the uh, queen who's in command of all that she surveys, she paused for a moment and then graciously said, yes, come up, come up. So we jumped up on the uh, bench. And as you can guess, uh, when we asked, is it safe to proceed? Uh, Dorothy said, uh, uh, I think so. And we stepped down, uh, but we had to endure two more attacks of the coyotes before Dorothy felt safe enough uh, and convinced enough of her power to discharge her fright about being eaten by a coyote uh, for us to proceed. Uh, and um, once uh, the uh, story had played itself out and she felt safe, uh, we went on with our walk. Uh, and uh, went into town and uh, got ice cream, uh, which should be the, uh, uh, the <laughs> end destination probably of, of most journeys. So, um, As I'm talking about uh, the coyote story, um, I would then ask, uh, coyotes wanting to attack small children, does that remind you of any fairy tale? Uh, and of course, you're all saying uh, Little Red Riding Hood. So let's talk about Little Red Riding Hood, about what happens in that story. Uh, there are, um, uh, the story goes like this. Um, and it's about a child being eaten by uh, the wolf, which is the uh, fairy tale version of Dorothy being eaten by the coyote. So uh, what happens in Little Red Riding Hood, as you recall, is uh, Little Red Riding Hood's going to visit her grandmother 
uh, and uh, her mother tells her, don't talk to anybody along the way, but she disobeys. She talks to the wolf. The wolf finds out where she's going, runs ahead, eats her grandmother. I'm condensing a lot of action here into uh, a very short uh, period of time. Uh, eats the grandmother, uh, dresses in the grandmother's clothes and jumps in the bed. Uh, and uh, when Little Red Riding Hood gets there, uh, the famous three lines, the most famous three lines in all uh, fairy tales, Grandma, uh, what big eyes you have, uh, the better to see you, dear. Grandma, what big ears you have, uh, the better to hear you, dear. And then the fateful Grandma, what big teeth you have, the better to eat you, dear. Uh, and uh, the wolf eats Little Red Riding Hood. But then something magical happens. We presume in the first part of the story that Little Red Riding Hood and Grandma are uh, crammed in uh, the wolf's st stomach. But as luck would have it, uh, the woodsman is coming by, um, understands what's going on, uh, very intuitive, I would assume, uh, chops open uh, the uh, wolf, and lo and behold, there's Grandma, not the worse for wear. There's Little Red Riding Hood, and they uh, pop out you know, as though they had, uh, you know, just ducked in out of the rain and they were uh, not the worse for wear for having been uh, chomped up, you know, by the nurse. This is the kind of stuff that goes on in uh, the magical parts of the mind and in storytelling, you know, all the time. So um, this is the world that in psychoanalytic theory we talk about as the world of internal objects. Uh, where it's quite easy and quite possible that a bad object can disguise itself inside a good object uh, and that a, a good object can be uh, imprisoned inside a bad object uh, but survive uh, and then be uh, released uh, and saved at some point in the future. So this is the physics of the altered internal psychological world that governs fantasies of young children, fairy tales, and also uh, that uh, sketches out possibilities for delusional beliefs. Now I'm going to tell you uh, two examples of delusions that mirror um, this uh, uh, theme of uh, being uh, eaten by wolves, eaten by coyotes. Uh, the first is a man uh, who, uh, let's call him Jason, 19-year-old man, uh, who um, was in our clinic at the hospital, uh, and he believed that a couple was having sex inside his body every night. Uh, this is very distressing for him. He was preoccupied by it. By it. Uh, he said that they would uh, enter into him after he had fallen asleep uh, and that they would leave in the morning. Uh, and uh, he knew this was going on because uh, he could feel certain vague sensations in his body that indicated to him what was going on. So the, uh, I'm condensing some work and listening to his story here, but the uh, therapist uh, suggested to him, um, you know, it sounds like this happens, you know, when you're falling asleep. And uh, the thought occurs to me, I don't know if it's, you know, has any bearing for you, but I think many men your age, uh, when they're falling asleep, uh, they might be having thoughts about the day even sexual fantasies. And I wonder if this idea that people are having sex inside you is your own personal way or version, some form of sexual daydreaming. And uh, this was all that needed to be said to him. Uh, he, he then said, well, you know, uh, I've been wondering too, how do they get in? You know, and, and, and there's no sign, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense to me. Uh, and then he says, and this is the associative psychodynamic work, you know, he, he says, and now that I'm telling you about this, Doc, you know, I, I never saw the woman, but uh, when I think about it, I think she probably looks like the first girlfriend that I had in junior high school. Uh, and uh, I, um, she was my first love, uh, but she left me for another boy in the class. So um, story uh, understood uh, that... Uh, this idea that this woman was inside him was part of a complicated grieving process that was going on for him, uh, where he just hadn't been able to let go of the first love of his life. Again, simple when you understand it. The next example, uh, I once worked with a woman uh, who was uh, not abused, but quite neglected by her parents. Uh, her parents seemed to uh, not emotionally engage her uh, very much at all. 
uh, and she went on a marathon uh, trip uh, around the country and ended up uh, in the psychiatric hospital in New York. Uh, so uh, I'm talking to her and, and she had found work when she came to New York and she, she told me uh, that she was a hostess in a re restaurant uh, that served cannibals. So again, one, one uh, can't have any sense of uh, irony about listening to this story. It means something. And uh, what had uh, uh, happened here was that um, her fear took the same form that Dorothy's fear took and that Little Red Riding Hood story is about, that her fear took the uh, imagined form in the story of being eaten. But in the story she tells, uh, she's the hostess. Uh, she's not on the menu. Uh, she's the one who's in control of the situation. And she said that she knew who the cannibals were and who the regular diners were because there was a slight twitch that she would get in her right eye uh, that would tell her which were supposed to go to the um, uh, cannibal room and which were supposed to go to the ordinary room. Uh, again, uh, simple. Uh, when you understand it. So I'm going to finish up uh, by uh, talking about the third issue, uh, a relationship between psychosis and ordinary mental life, uh, which has to do with the personal myths that we all tell ourselves, our own origin stories, uh, the things we say to ourselves about how we came to be who we are, how we chose uh, who we've chosen to be with, uh, uh, why we took certain directions in life. So Dorothy deals with her fear of being eaten by the coyotes uh, uh, by escaping to the park bench. Samantha crafted a story about a murderous cat to deal with her terror about abandonment. Uh, Jason envisioned a couple inside his body to deal with his grief about his first love. And in Emily's story, um, she escapes uh, from uh, being attacked by cannibals. And we all have a story to tell uh, about how we came to be that's full of fantasies uh, and distortions uh, with uh, some mix of historical truth. We edit out details and distort certain me memories as we're telling our own stories. One of the most powerful uh, invocations of this truth that we all have stories to tell uh, is Arthur Miller's the play, The Price. It's less well known than The Death of a Salesman, but it's a fantastic uh, play. And in the play, um, two brothers, uh, Victor and Walter Franz, they're the central characters. Uh, they meet, having been estranged for many years uh, to discuss the disposition of their deceased father's estate. And uh, as the two brothers uh, reminisce and talk to each other about uh, uh, their family life and what happened to them, uh, their versions of their family and their life are entirely different. So Victor's version, of uh, the story is that uh, Walter, his brother, abandoned the family uh, and that he, Victor, sacrificed his life uh, to save his father, uh, who he saw as being uh, uh, very vulnerable because of the way he had suffered uh, during the Great Depression. Um, and um, Walter, um, uh, that uh, the, the brother that uh, Victor thought had abandoned the family, uh, Walter saw it very differently, uh, and he told Victor in this meeting that, no, actually, father was never uh, impoverished. Uh, he had savings. He had plenty of money. You didn't have to stay there and take care of him and dedicate your life to financing him. Uh, he fooled you. He used you. Uh, he took advantage uh, of your good side. And so here's what Walter says uh, to his brother, Victor. We invent ourselves, Vic to wipe out what we know. We invent a life of self-sacrifice, a life of duty. But what never existed here cannot be upheld. You're not upholding something. You were denying what you knew our parents were and denying yourself. And that's all that is standing between us now, an illusion that, that I kick them in the face and that you must uphold them against me. But I only saw then what you see now. There was nothing there, nothing there to betray. I'm not your enemy. It's an illusion. And if you could walk through it, we could meet. So in a certain way, what we're doing in psychotherapy, I think, is we're trying to walk through an illusion uh, and meet someone, see someone, uh, and uh, connect emotionally with uh, 
their version of their life. This idea of personal myth uh, has been written about uh, in the psychoanalytic literature, principally by an analyst named uh, Ernst Chris, and also by Jacob Arlo, uh, who um, presents a very interesting uh, psychoanalytic case of uh, a man uh, who believed that his right leg uh, was fractured when he was five years old. Uh, and he believed that this led to his uh, uh, physical disability so that he wasn't chosen to be parts of athletic teams. And this became the central explanation for uh, this patient uh, of why he was an outsider uh, in school. Uh, but it came to light during the analysis uh, that actually uh, he had never fractured his leg. He'd made it up. Uh, he'd made up uh, the central turning point of his personal myth and his personal life history. So I'll finish up uh, by um, reading a long paragraph here. So, until our personal myths are contradicted by circumstances or we question them in our own therapy, we don't doubt the truth of our personal myths uh, because they're narratives that we crafted to serve our emotional needs. In closing, let me lay down a challenge. Turn your attention for a moment to your life story as you have come to understand it over time. As you are thinking about your life, uh, observe whether in telling your life story, uh, you would ever have occasion to say that you made an important life decision to do something that you really did not want to do. In your life story, we find you doing things you really did not want to do. Uh, but I say that part of your story is missing when you say that. When we say that we did not act as we wished, we are really saying that we are not consciously aware of all the motivations that led us to act as we did. Our unconscious motives can be love and fear and many other sentiments that play a part in our decisions unbeknownst to us. But choices made in the face of realities uh, that don't yield to our imaginations. People who stay uh, with partners while saying they really wanted to leave are individuals who say uh, that they did not want to pursue the line of work that they actually chose are simply unaware of the conflicting motives that actually determined their choices. Perhaps we were too afraid to act as we imagined we might, or perhaps we loved someone too much to leave them and strike out in another direction in life. At which point we would be justified in saying to the people who claim that they have not lived as they really wish to, though, yes, with the sympathy that comes from knowing how hard it is to be human and to live a life without illusion, we would say to them, my friend, you are delusional as we all are. So let me stop there. Um, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to speak to all of you.